Hey gang, it's Will, and uh, I haven't done a video in a few weeks, and I thought that I should do one about my latest completed project while it was still fresh. I'm not sure if you can see it here with the camera angle, but um, it was my 1-6 Tamiya Honda Monkey, or the Z50 as it's more commonly known to dirt bike guys. And um, it's a really it's a really cool kit and uh, I want to go through it and give you guys uh, a little bit of a look at what I did with it and the kit itself and kind of tell you uh, maybe some of the things I learned from it because it was definitely a learning experience. I had no idea what I was getting into when I bought this thing. Um, it was uh, the first kit that I bought after I made the commitment to get back into building scale models and I thought it would be a fun way to offset the ass whipping that I was taking from my Hasegawa 132nd P51 Mustang. And in a lot of ways it was. That was a good decision, but uh, I had no idea. Um, I bought it because I'm a dirt bike guy, have been my whole life, and my very first dirt bike was a beat up old Honda Z50. And uh, I thought, hey, I've never built a motorcycle kit before, why not? And I know that Tamiya kits are really good, so this will be a great way to start. And uh, as it turns out, Tamiya no longer produces this kit, but you can find them on eBay pretty easily, which would turn out to be a good thing. So anyway, this is the, uh, this is the box top for it. And... This kit dates back to 1978, as far as I can tell, but it's been re-released in several different incarnations, which is fine because um, the Honda Monkey itself hasn't changed much in 40 years. It's the same basic bulletproof design that it's always been. So that would turn out to be helpful, as I'll explain later. But anyway, this is the version that I got. This is the original one. And um, uh, it, uh, when I opened the box, I found out, first of all, that all of the things people say about Tamiya kits being beautifully engineered are very true. The second thing is that uh, it has lots and lots of parts, and I'll show you. All right, hopefully I've angled the camera so that you guys can see this fairly well. And you can tell immediately that this is a pile of parts, uh, some of which I've already gotten into. This thing has got uh, close to 200 pieces, and every one of them is just beautifully molded. There's the uh, headlight lens, which is indistinguishable from the real thing when you look at it uh, up close. You get some parts that are in this weird sort of metallic red. And I don't even know why they did that. It's not really useful because um, that's, not, that's not the color that you're going to... I mean, I guess you could, but at any rate, you get some of those. You get a bunch of parts on black sprues. And you get a bunch of very nice chrome parts. Now I know there are people who say um, that they immediately strip the chrome off of chrome parts and uh, respray them with all clad or some other method because they feel like it's a more realistic finish. And I think in some cases that makes sense, especially if you're dealing with parts that are polished aluminum instead of chrome. But there's, you know, chromed steel, uh, I haven't found any way that you're going to get any more of a realistic finish than you will with actual um, plating on plastic parts. The problem comes in with things like parting lines, you know, where you have uh, things that you want to, um, you know, like these handlebars, where you want to remove that parting line, even though on this Tamiya kit it's very slight, you're going to leave some evidence of that. And, you know, you may feel like that repainting it with something like all clad is better than having 
you know, a thin black line where you add that flash off of there with your hobby knife. It's really a kind of a kind of a judgment call. It's you know, you just have to make a choice about what's more important to you. But the bottom line with these with these Tamiya parts is their plating is excellent, and um, the, the quality of the molding is just fantastic. Something that you might not know about about chrome plating, uh, at, well, so-called chrome plating on plastic model parts is that it's not really plating. What it is is vapor metal deposition, and it's actually a very thin uh, aluminum that is put on in a vacuum chamber and it's a it's a pretty cool process and there are people that will do it for you on a one-off basis as well so I guess if you were really serious about it you could strip the chrome do all your finish work and then send them off and have them redone in with uh, with with new surfacing I'm not quite that serious yet this kit also gives you a set of parts that have got the same kind of, of, uh, of plating on them, but in a more satin finish. And that gives you uh, a look that's a little bit closer to uh, the die-cast aluminum parts on the real thing. I ended up stripping off quite a bit of it because, for example, on the rims, I knew that they were going to be painted, and uh, I, didn't want, I didn't want to deal with having any issues of paint not sticking to to this because it is aluminum and um, as you aircraft guys know paint doesn't stick to aluminum and that's why you have special primers like uh, zinc chromate the old green stuff that's on so many American World War II aircraft but on a lot of these parts I just added washes and did varying you know different I did just just a lot of various things to uh, create the look of, of real metal as much as I want. Now in this anniversary kit, these are some of the optional parts. Uh, you get some different exhausts that you can use and uh, that's that's a pretty cool thing. Tamiya does a great job with their tires and these are the ones that come with the monkey. And you've also got a little bag here full of screws and nuts and springs. Uh, there are quite a few places on the kit where those uh, are required. And then you also get this stuff. This is one of my favorite things in this in, the, in this kit. This is this Tamiya vinyl tubing that's used to simulate cables and wires. And it's too big for some things, like an electrical wire. But for most of the stuff on this kit, it works out great. And Tamiya gives you little stubs that basically you just push the push the tubing onto and in most cases you don't even need any glue stuff is fantastic and in the and in the instructions they even tell you how long to cut each piece for the for the given cable that you're making and uh, it's it's just really good fun stuff anyway so this gives you a little bit of an idea about the uh, about the kit as a whole all right and here are the results I will try and uh, give you guys a little bit of a better view of it. Um, we'll zoom in a little bit, see if I can manage some camera work. There you go, that's a pretty good look at it. I'll try and put some photographs up too so you can see it even better. But you can see this kit is is really cool. I mean if you take the time to do the paintwork and the finishing to give you uh, the variety of metal finishes that you'd see on the real thing you know it, it, it really does produce a, a beautiful model here you go you can see the other side of it Sorry, my camera work is not so good. You guys know my hands aren't super steady, but this will give you a, a kind of a decent look at it. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do is just give you guys a quick little tour of some of the things I did and some of the things that I learned. And I'm not going to go in any particular order, just kind of as I see them and, uh, and think of them. One thing I learned is that 
not only is it very difficult to mask a white upholstery accent stripe, but acrylic paints don't stick to this stuff very well. If you look close, uh, sometimes not even if you look close, you can see that there are some places where this paint has peeled. And I even put a coat of satin varnish over the top of it, and uh, it just doesn't want to stay there. So I may end up redoing that at some point if it really bugs me. But it's not a huge deal. Another thing about the seat is if you look back here, you'll see that the decal looks terrible. I put a bunch of solve set on that thing, but I guess that with old decals you can just never be really sure. Um, you know, it kind of is what it is because uh, I don't have a spare, so I had to use I had to use that one. Another thing that I did with the seat that I'm pretty stoked about is it's got these snaps all the way around it, and they're molded in, and they want you to paint them silver, of course. But I knew that that wasn't going to look cool, and I found these uh, little these weird little straight pins. Um, I say they're weird because uh, they don't even have a, a point. I'm not sure what they're used for, but they have a nice flat head. And I just drilled out these these old snaps and super glued these in and then clipped them off on the backside. And they make a perfectly realistic looking snap head. If I could find some that have a dome shaped head, I'd be even better off. But I still thought that looked uh, pretty cool and, and added a, a, nice, uh, a nice bit of realism. One of the things that I really tried to do a lot of with this was add all of the wires and cables that I knew, you know, were on the real thing and that uh, I knew would really help with the realism. So, uh, one place where they, they don't have one for you is the uh, magneto lead. And uh, the Tamiya tubing was too big for that and I wanted it to be a little bit different. Um, so I found this uh, black artistic wire. It's actually copper wire on Amazon, and it comes in all different gauges. Uh, I forget what gauge this is, but um, I think it's 18 gauge actually. Uh, but anyway, it's pre-colored, and that makes it really nice for making black uh, cabling or black wires. Super cheap. It was like seven bucks for a roll of a. 60 feet, which I will never use in my entire life, probably. Um, another place where I added uh, a hose was right here, the carburetor vent tube. Um, and I also added a crankcase vent tube, which is a little bit harder to see because it's back behind this frame member. Um, but those are both on the real thing. Wherever I added a tube, what I did is I drilled a hole and I cut off a little tiny chunk of one of those straight pins and just glued it in there and it created the perfect size stub to slip the end of this tubing over. Another thing that I did was, uh, if you look down here, it's kind of hard to see, but this hose on the real thing is held on with a clip uh, that's actually um, on this crankcase bolt head. And what I did to simulate that in sort of a reasonable way was I just used a little tiny piece of bare metal foil right there that cut that cut it in a rectangular shape and just wrapped it around there and uh, super glued it on and um, I thought it worked out pretty good you know if you're not too close it looks okay <laughs> hey that's that's like a lot of things with these with these model kits right um, another place where I added some some wiring was for these uh, left and right hand side combination switches that's what's used too. Uh, turn on the, the blinkers and uh, the headlights and so forth. And those are zip tied to the handlebars. And so what I did was I used 1 16th inch uh, uh, Okay, I had to do a little restart there. Anyway, what I used to simulate the zip ties was 1 16th inch uh, pinstriping tape. And I just super glued one end of it down and then wrapped it around and super glued it again and clipped it off. And that was, uh, you know, especially with my clumsy hands, that was a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a micro scale wrestling match, but I think it was well, well worth the effort. Um, you know, because you've got to have those, you got to have those zip ties on there um, in order for that to, to, uh, 
to look right. Um, I also created a little bit of a wiring harness. You won't be able to see too much of it, but um, it's in here. You can see it right there. This is uh, where the leads from the combination switches and from the headlight casing all go back uh, to an imaginary point under the gas tank, which is actually, you know, like the uh, CDI box or, you know, some other type of a junction box. And uh, that worked out. That worked out pretty good. Uh, since I just adjusted the brake pedal, let me tell you that this assembly right here for the brake pedal, which actually is a live linkage, was the worst part of the whole model. Um, if you see stuff posted online about this kit, you'll notice that a lot of people end up breaking this off when they put it together. Um, it, it, I, I put a rant about this on my thread uh, on, on International Scale Modeler because this is a case where Tamiya, Tamiya's engineering is just a little too good. Um, it's just over-engineered and I also found this in some other places with this kit where the tolerances on the mating parts are just so tight that even the thinnest coat of paint will screw them up. And, and sometimes even without a thin coat of paint, as was the case here, um, this, this assembly uh, is actually this, this two pieces right here for this, this uh, lever arm and clevis. And the tolerances are just too tight. It's over constrained. And it took me two and a half hours to assemble this lever to the end of this rod. Um, and basically I ended up cutting away all of the guide pins and doing, you know, some filing and reaming. And I, it was just, it was a nightmare. Um, you know, I respect Tamiya's engineering and I understand why they want everything to fit perfectly. But there's a point where, you know, you have to relax the tolerances a little bit. Um, I know that from my engineering background and from some hard lessons I learned myself as a as a young engineer. But uh, you know, I, I ultimately I got it all put together and it worked out uh, pretty good. Another thing that I learned um, that I can see from here is that making stripes like this is very hard. Uh, I actually went through three different iterations of this. I initially tried to mask it off with some pinstriping tape and spray it on, and that just didn't work very well. Um, I had bleed on the edges, and the tape that I bought, I, you know, maybe it was because it's just not good pinstriping tape. Um, you know, it didn't conform to this compound curve very well, and so I had some leakage, and with stripes like that, they've got to be perfect. Uh, my next try was to paint the black stripe and then use decal material to try and hide the less than crisp edge. And that didn't work either because uh, the decal tape is, or the decal film is, is too transparent and you can see that edge. And it just didn't, it just, it just wasn't good. So um, I was about to completely strip all that paint. Actually, I did strip that paint um, since it was acrylic, I just soaked it in some, some Windex for a couple of hours and then scrubbed it off with a toothbrush. Um, but, but it still was screwed up, and so I decided to mess with that later. And I did what anybody who's got two kits and wants to move on would do. Uh, <laughs> I just took the gas tank out of the other kit and built it and started from, from scratch. And that's what this one is. And these stripes are sort of a hybrid. The black one is painted on, and it came out pretty good. And the red are actually strips of red decal film. And again, not perfect. You know, if you look close, you can see some some places where they're not quite straight. But overall, it uh, it worked out worked out pretty good. And um, you know, it is what it is. I'm uh, overall I'm happy with it. I think. Um, next time I'll try to get some higher quality pinstripe masking tape and uh, you know maybe have another go at painting them but I'm, I'm going to avoid that two-tone pinstripe as much as possible in the future because uh, it uh, looks really good when you're done but uh, man it's uh, it's a tough bit of work uh, so um, not sure if I'll uh, if I'll ever have the opportunity to revisit that 
Um, another thing that uh, I learned with this kit that uh, huh, was also a wrestling match was that that tolerance stack up that I talked about earlier will come back to haunt you in ways that you might also find if you were building the real thing. Now, as a motorcycle guy, I've done lots of wrenching on real bikes, including uh, Z50s. And, you know, when you get uh, to the point where you're putting the engine in the frame or adding the exhaust pipe, you can wrestle stuff around and make bolts slide in, and if you need to, you can even, you know, use a, use a, a, little, a little persuasion of the hammer variety. But obviously, you can't do that at one sixth scale. And when you get around to where you've got everything painted up and you go to put on something like this exhaust pipe and the tolerances have stacked up between the engine, and the, the cases, and the cylinder head, and the frame, and now you've got to make this pipe connect with this bolt hole over here plus another one underneath, again, it's just too much. It's over-constrained. And so the big lesson that I learned on that is that next time um, I'm going to definitely dry fit all of that uh, before any paint goes on. So I will completely re revise the way that uh, the, the way that I approach this. Um, I, I originally tried to paint everything and then put it together uh, because I, you know, that's the way the real parts are, and. That's that's one of the things that I think makes this kit actually. I don't have a lot of experience. I mean, there's tons of kits that I haven't built, and uh, you know I see these guys building tigers with hundreds of parts. So this may be uh, talking out of school, but I think that a kit like this has to be one of the most difficult to build, and it's for the simple reason that you have so many varieties of of metal finish, paint polished aluminum, chrome plate, die cast aluminum, plastic. And if you really you really want it to look good, you've got to treat each one of those individually. And it's very unforgiving because especially at this scale, everything is just right there in your face. You know, it's not like um, you know, a 148th Spitfire where, you know, some of it's going to get hidden with weathering and it's too small to see. Um, this, you know, to get a, uh, whoops, to get a real realistic appearance, you've got to take the time to address each one of those finishes individually. And that's the thing that drove me crazy. I got so tired of painting and retouching and redoing, I thought it was never going to be over. But ultimately, I think that the effort uh, proved to be worthwhile. Um, and the attention to detail, I think, uh, really pays off. Speaking of detail, real quick, one of the things that I hate the most is painting bolt heads. And I really got to refine that on my technique for that on this kit. What I started doing was I waited until after I'd put on the last uh, the last bit of, of paint or clear varnish. You know, I use Future a lot for that. And because that's acrylic, then I would go back and I would paint the bolt head with enamel. And I've been using this Model Master Chrome Silver a lot. And the reason I use enamel is because if you screw up and get it in the wrong place, you just come back with a brush lightly moistened with mineral spirits and just wash it away where you don't want it. And you can do that 24 or 48 hours or however long uh, later. And so you have um, way more control than if you were just trying to apply the paint perfectly each time. Um, I'm at my absolute worst with a paintbrush in my hand and, you know, there's no hope for me if I have to get it right the first time. So, you know, this uh, technique uh, really worked well for me. And uh, I can, you know, actually approach that task without nearly as much stress because I know that it's not a, you know, it's not a one-shot deal. So anyway, I've been rambling on for a long time, and this is going to be another long video, but hopefully, uh, you know, you guys will find it entertaining and, and useful. And um, as always, I really appreciate you guys sitting through this and uh, hanging with me for this long and checking out my project. All right? Much love, guys. Take care.